Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Thursday. Man, do we have an awesome show planned for you today. Guess who's in studio? Bryson Gray and Shamika Michelle. Round of applause for both of them. Uh, Delano Squires is going to join us from Washington, D.C. at the top of the show. Uh, Steve Kim and Jordan Bowles will be here on the back end of the show. We're going to start today uh, with an unscripted fire starter, unscripted mono, where I just, I, I want to try to lead and set up a conversation about Pride Month. Today is the first day of Pride Month. We've been talking about it all week, and now it's here. I came in to today very optimistic. I, 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 yesterday, if you heard the show, uh, I had some optimism about where things were headed, which direction I thought the wind was blowing. And then this morning, uh, I saw Jeremy Boring, the CEO of The Daily Wire, I saw his Twitter thread about what was transpiring between he and Elon Musk and The Daily Wire, and the, they wanted to air what is a woman on Twitter. And I can't say it's Elon Musk, but Twitter basically refused to air it after agreeing to air it because they watched it and said, well, you've misgendered two people. And so we're not, this is part of our hate speech and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I just said, oh my God, I, I thought Twitter was different now. I thought Twitter was moving in a completely different direction and it's not. And, and it, it reminds me of the conversation we had yesterday, but I want to walk you through a tiny bit of history on why I think all of this is so important. The fact that Twitter is still seemingly going to remain uh, heaven for the LGBTQ movement, and that's what Twitter has been for the past decade. It is, it is the gay mat matrix. It's, it's where... Uh, all gay dreams come true over Twitter. The, the whole thing, I've, I've said for years, you can go back eight years ago, nine years ago, I was saying like, black Twitter is really gay Twitter. They just call it black Twitter. But anyway, I wanna walk you through a tiny bit of history and just, just so we have a foundation that we're talking about when we talk about Pride Month, how we got here. J just some of this is well known, other, you can pick it up any place, but like Pride Month started because there was a gay riot in lower Manhattan, New York, I believe June 28th, 1969, at some place called the Stonewall Inn. It was a bar, a gay bar, again, in lower Manhattan, owned by the mafia. They have a slew of riots in this place over a few days. And, and so out coming out of that, the gay lesbian community started placing a priority on a Pride Month, a celebration of them. And, and, and then over the next 30 years, it kept growing and growing and growing until in 1999, Bill Clinton declared the month of June Pride Month for gays and lesbians. He made this declaration kind of nationalized and gave it the official White House stamp of approval. June, in remembrance of Stonewall Inn, is now Pride Month for gays and lesbians. And then a dozen years later, in 2011, Barack Obama declared that ah, it's not just for gays and lesbians, it's for bisexuals, transgenders, queers, all the alphabets got added to Pride Month because of Barack Obama in 2012. And so it's easy for people to conclude that, hey, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama kick-started, gave the whole Pride movement uh, power and a jump start, and they were very influential, and they were. But I don't think anything has been as powerful and as significant for the LGBTQ movement than the invention, the advent of Twitter in 2006. 
Twitter put the LGBT alphabet mafia on steroids. Twitter became the place that penalized any public figure that stuck to or promoted biblical values in a public way. You could have your faith, you could have your biblical values as long as you did not state them on a public platform. If a public figure, a pundit, had the audacity to go on a platform and say something biblically sound as it related to sexuality or gender, they paid a price. This, the best example of this is in 2013. I think we, we have the clip of Chris Broussard in 2013. This is April 29th. I think this is one of the Collins brothers, Jason or Jaron, I can't remember which one's gay. One of these NBA players, they're twin brothers, one of them is gay. And in April of 2013, this, this comes out, and Chris Broussard was on Outside the Lines and had this exchange. He mentioned in, in his article, Jason, that, that he is a Christian as well. So what's your take on that? Personally, I, I don't believe that you can live an openly homosexual lifestyle or an openly pre, like premarital sex between heterosexuals. If you're openly living that type of lifestyle, then the Bible says you know them by their fruits. It says that, you know, that's a sin. And if you're openly living in unrepentant sin, whatever it may be, not just homosexuality, adultery, fornication, premarital sex between heterosexuals, whatever it may be, I believe that's walking in open rebellion to God and to Jesus Christ. So I would not characterize that person as a Christian because I don't think the Bible would characterize him as a Christian. LZ, your response? Well, my response is, is that faith, just like love, just like marriage, is personal. And that if you try to use a broad brush to paint everyone's faith, what you really are painting is a world in which is comfortable for you and not a world in which in this country we're allowed varying forms of religion. And just because someone doesn't agree with one person's interpretation of the Bible versus the other doesn't mean that they have the exclusive rights to dictate what that person, how that person should live. I would love not to have premarital sex, but in this country, I'm not allowed to get married. So that's 2013. I think Shamika and, and Bryson, would you agree what, what Chris Broussard said, said there, not really controversial. Right. It's common sense True. Bible talk. Yeah. And so, Twitter didn't react that way. Twitter melted down. He, LZ Granderson, the guy that came on afterwards, if you couldn't tell by his voice, he's part of the Alphabet <clears throat> Mafia. He's a soldier in, in their movement. And, and so Twitter reacted as if uh, Chris Broussard had gone on television and whipped his thing out and said, all the gays need to suck on this. That's how they reacted. And, and, and basically, that was the end of his ESPN career. Chris was a high profile ESPN employee, was on their NBA pregame show and all this stuff. And after these comments and after the Twitter lynch mob came after him and painted him as one of the worst humans on the planet, his career at ESPN took a slow descent. And by 2016, he was out of there. Uh, because all they would offer him at that point was a sideline reporting job, and, and it was just done. Chris Broussard's reputation and career marred by Twitter. That is what Twitter has been doing for the past decade. If someone comes out and says anything that offends or isn't in agreement with the LGBTQ crowd, they're portrayed as homophobic and unworthy of employment. It's not fair, and I thought that Elon Musk was changing that up. I thought that Twitter was going to be a bit more tolerant of people with a biblical worldview as it relates to sex and gender. But as I talked about yesterday, this whole World Economic Forum, the WEF, and their whole 
CEI, Corporate Equality Index Mandate, that they're forcing on all corporations. And CEI is about uh, fairness and the treatment and policies within companies as it relates to the alphabet mafia. They're a special group. And the WEF and their Corporate Equality Index are forcing these values on all corporations. And so when Elon Musk named this woman Linda Yacarino, or Yacarino, I can't pronounce her last name, but Linda, whoever, she's from the WEF. And that was a red flag, and people immediately hopped on it. Elon's a, critical, uh, a critic of the WEF, but he hired someone straight from there to take over Twitter, and now this thing between the Daily Wire and Twitter and the not allowing what is a woman to be shown. And, and Jeremy Boring writes a really compelling thread on social media about his exchange and it seems very fair and it seems very transparent about how they had agreed and then it got ixnayed and now it's over and he doesn't know how Elon Musk is gonna react. But all of this makes me skeptical and a, a quite a bit uh, where I was like, hey man, I think we're getting some victories here. Look at Bud Light, look at Target, look at North Face. I'm, if, if, the, if the Alphabet Mafia controls Twitter, they cannot be stopped because that controls public perception. That, that's what normalized. And again, if you go back, and see how quickly on a dime opinions changed about same-sex marriage. It's because Twitter normalized it and penalized anybody that didn't agree with same-sex marriage, and so everyone hopped on board. If they still control Twitter, they will win. I, I woke up this morning, read all this stuff, watched this, thought about it, and, and I'm back now to being more cynical and, and just like, they control corporate America, they control us, they control Twitter, they control public thought, perception. I'm feeling a tiny bit hopeless today. Uh, Bryson, Shamika, Delano, uh, talk me out of this. <laughs> well, I remember we had a show on here a couple months ago about Elon Musk. Yeah. And I had warned people because he is a liberal. He was raising his children children gender neutral. So I, I'm not shocked one bit. Also, what's funny is when Twitter first came out, if people remember, it was promoted as the free speech platform, which it was at the beginning, but it gave uh, the radical LGBT people, well, all of them are radical, every single one of y'all, but um, the LGBT people, it gave them the ability to um, unite and team up with ease and they took advantage of that and they still do with twitter which is why they run everything and then they normalize it in tv they normalize it in commercials you can't even watch a commercial without seeing a gay person but christians didn't take advantage of it the same way there's more of us than it is of them oh i don't know because a lot of christians nowadays they're like gay simps gay, gay sympathizers uh especially conservatives but um, so they took advantage of it, and that's why a small percentage of the population now runs the media, runs the narrative, they run everything, and it is in part because of Twitter, and I can't wait for Tesla to drop their Pride Month tweet. <laughs> <laughs> hold, hold, let me, in real time, as we sit here and, mm. and tape this show, in real time, we're getting updated information. Elon Musk has put out a statement. Mm. What is he that? just put it out. Uh, two minutes ago, uh, this was a mistake by many people at Twitter. It is definitely allowed. Whether or not you agree with using someone's preferred pronouns, not doing so is at most rude and certainly breaks no laws. I should note that I do personally use someone's preferred pronouns just as I use someone's preferred name simply from the standpoint of good manners. However, for the same reason I object to rude behavior, ostracism, or threats of violence if the wrong pronoun or name is used. So. Still a liberal. Mm. He's still a liberal. <laughs> it's definitely for himself, but I do appreciate that he's saying he's going to let the show go forth because I actually liked 
what was a woman. And I, anytime I want to get somebody on the same page with me as knowing where we are in this trans fight, I say just go watch that because I think it shows a good, um, you know, well-rounded view of where the doctors are, where teachers are. And a lot of people don't know how many doctors are really in on performing these surgeries on kids. So I was disappointed when I saw that this wasn't going to be allowed because it's been what I've been telling people to find to get them on the same page with us. So, yeah, he is still a liberal because he says, you know, I'm going to call Caitlyn Jenner she pretty much is what he's saying, <laughs> you know, but I appreciate the fact that he's not going to, at least for now, stop this. But I think if Jeremy didn't have a big platform. I, I'm, I, I'm not gonna say it's the big platform that's done it, but Delano, I, I'm, you've been mm -hmm. waiting patiently. Jump in here uh, with any of your thoughts. So I, I'd say this, I, I think there's reason to be hopeful. Um, I don't, but I'd say that reason is not because of Elon Musk, right? And I think, you know, we talk about faith a lot on the show, and I think it's important to always reaffirm that our faith is in the eternal, unchanging, everlasting word of God, right? That, that is my only source of hope. Um, I do not place hope in politicians. I don't place hope in, in members of the media um, or social movements because all of those things can be corrupted. And I think in many respects, and, and, and I um, certainly would, would hope at some point to, to respond to your column yesterday, I think Elon Musk is to corporate America and, and big tech what Donald Trump is to politics, right? These are people who conservatives place a lot of hope in because they've said certain things that say, okay, this person ref respects free speech, this person is anti-woke. But as Bryson and Shamika said, um, both are at heart liberals, uh, and their foundation is not the same as our foundation. So even though we may get to the same place, at least on the surface on certain issues, um, they can much e they can be moved much easier than we can. And, and that's why I think Elon Musk says he uses people's preferred pronouns. And that's why Donald Trump a few years back had his iconic photo, LGBTs for Trump. Um, so I, I don't think we should place too much hope in either of these individuals, even when they do certain things that we agree with from time to time. Okay, but isn't there a difference between placing hope in and just recognizing that Jack Dorsey, if he were still running Twitter, what happened today would not have happened. True. This mm -hmm. man has just contradicted his CEO and all the people and said, it's a mistake, it shouldn't happen, it's gonna get corrected. That's better than what we had previously. He's fighting, it's not, it's not better than what we had previously. He's fighting a whole group of people out in San Francisco that are, 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 are trying to impose something that he knows is unfair and he's drawing a line. That's not better? So I've been on Twitter since its existence, and the most I've seen people get censored and banned is with Elon Musk. The, I, I, really? Facts. Ask anybody. Ask, ask anybody else. Up. Like the most I've seen people get banned is with Elon Musk. You know what I'm saying? Now Elon Musk may be Lenny, and he brought people back, so he did do some things that were good. But he said himself, he 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 thinks hate speech is real. He said it means freedom of uh, freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of reach, even though it should in the public square, mm -hmm. which means he will shadow ban you if you have hate speech. Yeah, he I tells you, like he, that. he tells you he's going to do like, like this. Like this man tells you what he's going to do, but he'll say something that you like or say something that's a little bit conservative, and we just ignore like, everything it's else. Not, I'm not. I don't care about what he says. I'm talking about what he just did. And 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 trust me, I'm someone that personally. Mm -hmm. You can look at my Twitter file and say, like, I'm shadow banned. They, they, my, my Twitter won't grow for months at a time, mm -hmm. and then it'll take off for two or three weeks, and then for months at a time, nothing. It just yeah. stands. I, I get that it's rigged against me still, but mm. this is better than what we had before. No? For me, it is because I got kicked off of Twitter um, for two months <laughs> right after the election. And then I went back to Twitter jail for saying um, 
I don't know who I misgendered, um, but for pr pretty much saying the truth that this man was actually a man and not a woman and they kicked me off mm. again. And I know that I haven't been able to actually get my stuff out there, but you know, it's been better. I've been a little bit more free and I don't think we would even be at the point where the Daily Wire would have wanted to get their content on Twitter under Jack Dorsey. I mean, they probably would have wanted to, but not getting as far as a contract. I just don't think that would have been possible. Lotto, go ahead. I know you're itching. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is is it better than Jack Dorsey? Sure. But I'm reminded of that Malcolm quote, and I'll paraphrase where he said, you can't plunge a knife into my back nine inches and then pull it out three and then say that what you're doing is progress. Again, I'm paraphrasing. So, I mean, <laughs> I, these e, e, Elon Musk is ultimately a businessman. He has, I think he is sensitive to conservative desires for a free speech platform, but ultimately he has liberal sensibilities. And I think what mm -hmm. we're seeing sort of in real time, right? Because we don't live in that squishy gray anymore. We don't live in a common grace era where it's a Christianized culture. So people sort of respect the 10 commandments. They don't steal, they don't commit adultery. You know, that's way, way back. But what we're seeing is a, a separation in, into black and white. And there, there will come a day where there will almost be an exact overlap of people who are willing to publicly call a man a man and a woman a woman and people who adhere to a specific type of religious traditional faith. That wasn't always the case. So hard leftists 20 years ago acknowledged only women could get pregnant. But the culture is moving so quickly and so much to the left that now when you hear people articulate certain views, you can almost with, let's say, 75 percent accuracy say, OK, this is this is a person, even if they're not a Christian, they subscribe to some type of religion that's not, you know, uh, statism or, or that Joe Biden is the supreme Ayatollah. Uh, and I think Elon Musk is one of those people who if you if you don't have a religious background, if you don't have a Christian foundation or worldview, you you are susceptible to be moved. And Elon is like that. Trump is like that. Almost all of the politicians are like that. So I, I just I don't put almost too much... all. Why, why do you say almost? Why do you say almost? Because, why not just because all? I, 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 I try not to be presumptuous. There may be some people who say, look, this is my line in the sand. I'm not compromising. They may work in local politics. But any of the presidential candidates, I'm, I'm assuming, can be and will be moved at some point. Uh, but I just know some people have shown certain things. To, to indicate to me that, that they have been moved. And oftentimes what it is, Jason, it's the people around them, right? So Elon, yes, he's, he's the head of Twitter. He's the owner. But if his CEO, if his, if his uh, chief uh, VPs and executives and friends and advisors are telling him, Elon, you don't want to be that type of person, right? You call Caitlyn Jenner she, then, then he's going to buckle. And at the end of the day, we all know, the four of us know, you will not get kicked out off of Twitter for denying that Jesus Christ is Lord. But you will if you deny that Caitlyn Jenner is a lady. And, and, and that is where we stand right now with that platform. That's the way it was before. And to a large extent, that's the way it continues to be right now. Go ahead, because I'm... No, I was going to say, I agree with what Delano is saying for the simple fact that we know that you have to be like a tree planted by the water in order not mm -hmm. to be moved. And so I feel like if you don't have roots, um, you're going to be easily swayed or swayed eventually. Okay, but but my, my take is, I know going in, Elon Musk is not a Christian. Right. I know going mm -hmm. in... Donald Trump is not a Christian. You say he is, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got, and so I don't hold them to those expectations to behave like a Christian. Like, if I ran Twitter, I mean, Trump, I'm an immovable object. There's a set of police I have. Free speech would happen. I could care, I could care less. But can you, can you hold Elon Musk in his own words, though? Elon Musk, quote, I am a free speech absolutist, end quote, in multiple interviews, actually. The, re the real truth is, if Elon Musk was actually going to give you a free speech platform, 
why would Daily Wire need to have the conversation anyway? Because social media is not that complicated. I've, 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 I've got social media as ran, ran, owned, and built and everything. He can just simply make it to where, tell everybody, we don't ban for this no more. Like, there's no, hate speech isn't a real thing. Then Daily Wire wouldn't even have to go through anything. They'll just post a dang on thing. But the fact that they even went through that shows you that Twitter, it, I feel like it gives you the illusion it's better. But it really isn't, because if it was, then we wouldn't have to worry, but we wouldn't be having this conversation as we speak if it was. Uh, okay, but right. do you not cut the guy any grace that he invested $44 billion? That's a big chunk of change. Mm -hmm. and, and he's... He doesn't want to lose it all, and so he's playing a game, with, and that, that's why I think he hired this Linda woman from the WEF. She, he's trying to thread the needle of not losing his shirt on this, because again, these corporations, this corporate equality index and the mm -hmm. CEI and DEI, they're being forced on all corporations, if you want any money from these central banks, and again, Elon Musk does businesses all over the globe, he needs to be somewhat, he can't be at total war with the central banks. So why buy it? He, he said he's buying Twitter because he's a free speech absolutist. Anything after that, I don't care what game he's playing. Because at that point, you didn't pick $44 billion up for me at that point. Because if you did, you would spend that money and do what you said you was going to do. Instead, he came in and played the game. Earlier earlier on, he, he actually collaborated with the um, what the people that get mad at you for any time you say something against Jews. ADL. ADL. He was with the ADL, tagged all of them. Uh, freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. And now he's hiring the WE, uh, WEF puppet. Um, so I don't really care about him investing $44 billion because he didn't do what he said he was going to do with the $44 billion. So at this point, he's just, he's just another businessman. Yeah, I think for me, if the Holy Ghost is a keeper, what's keeping Elon? If, mm. like, what's going to snatch him back? Like, when I think about even myself being raised in the church, having a foundation, when I walked away and said, I don't want to do this anymore, and then I saw the world pretty much going to, to hell in a handbasket, something snatched me back to where I knew the difference between right and wrong and things that I had been taught as a child, you know, that God created male and female. So for mm -hmm. me to even lean to that side to be like, oh, I can call, you know, a, a guy, a girl, if that's what he wants. What's been instilled in me snatches me from that. So for somebody that doesn't have that, I'm always worried about or wondering what they're going to do because they don't have that anchor. And so I do think that it's better than Jack Dorsey, but I don't. I wouldn't be shocked if Elon swayed because there's no anchor, at least in the type of things that we have our anchor in. Delano, make your follow-up point, and also, if there's something you want to address about the Trump thing, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, again, my, my point is that um, it, it's, it's not that I can't recognize how one person is an improvement on another. I'm just saying that um, I'm reluctant to put too much hope in any of these people because I know that their foundation is built on sinking sand. So this is this is the this is the critique of conservatives in general that conservatives are basically just liberals driving the speed limit. So wherever liberals are today, conservatives will be two and a half years from now, um, and I, and I think that that's largely accurate. The the, the point with Trump is is similar, right? Um, I think your position is Trump is the only person who can go up against you know these global entities and really put his foot down to stop the the encroachment of pride on every or into every area of American life. And I just, I don't see that. Uh, this is the same person who said Caitlyn Jenner can use whatever bathroom he wants to at Mar-a-Lago. And then Jenner came with a camera crew in, into that, into Mar-a-Lago and, and, you know, they showed him coming out the bathroom and saying, thanks Donald for giving me that freedom. Um, this is the same person who was selling LG Pride merch on his, on his website. I'm not sure if this was 2016 or somewhere between 2016 and 2020. Um, this is the same person who was criticized for not recognizing Pride Month in 2018. Oh, there it is. This is this is LGBTs for for Trump person. So th there's nothing in me that says that believes 
that either Trump or Elon or any other journalist or executive or politician or even many preachers who do not have a clearly and explicitly biblical worldview on matters of sex, sexuality, and gender identity. There's nothing in me that believes that they cannot be moved if the pressure gets turned up high enough. And they'll do exactly what you talked about, Jason, which is trying to thread a needle. The, the fact that we are even entertaining the notion that saying a man can't get preg- cannot get pregnant is hate speech should just tell you how far we've all been dragged left in the last 15 years. So, so no, I don't, I, I appreciate them for what they do. I just hold them loosely in terms of uh, holding on to their promises or their, you know, their, their declarations about, you know, what it is that they stand for and their values. So that, that's, that's the large, the large point that I want to get across. I, I listened to y'all's argument, and yours in particular, Delano, and it just confirmed, it's like, well, Delano's just making my argument why I've never voted. That it's all just a <laughs> conversation to me. I don't take any of these people seriously. Uh, <laughs> but it's all just a conversation. They're politicians, or they got involved in politics. And, 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 and I just sit there and say, my, my position on Trump is for me, his inclusion in the political realm helped open my eyes to just how corrupt things are. And I'm never going to disavow him for those reasons. He was a catalyst for for taking the blinders off of me. And I don't, none of the other people that I see propel me in that direction. They all Mm. just seem like, hey, status quo. Let's, let's, it's almost like they, they want uh, they got a different version of Trump. Let's make America just a little bit corrupt again. And, <laughs> and that would be better. And, and so I, I don't hear DeSantis. I don't hear, maybe, only other guy I hear, Robert F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy Jr., when he said the CIA killed my uh, dad and uncle, that, that I like that. that. That's the kind of truth that I, and so that's what I give him credit for. That's what I give Trump credit for It's like, They've exposed the deep state. I'm t- Before Trump, I didn't even know what a deep state was. Me either. It had never yeah. crossed my mind. <laughs> and so but, I give him credit for that, and I just don't see anybody else advancing that topic. But, but credit Jason, uh, doesn't... Uh, oh. No, I'm just going to go quick. Go ahead. But uh, credit mm-hmm. doesn't negate the fact, right? So Trump has a lot of positive about him. But when we talk about deep state, then you have to look who 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 was the top three most funded politicians by Big Pharma. Do you know? Probably Trump. Trump, Trump number two, Biden number one. You know what I'm saying? Trump had Johnson and Johnson on stage, ooh, do the dancing. Trump called would call uh, Bruce Jenner she in a heartbeat, easy breezy. So what I'm saying is he can't. He has good about him. Economically, I don't think nobody is touching Trump. But overall, when, when it comes to the anchor we talked about, my anchor is God. Are you for or against God? And to be frank, Trump is against God. And then people was like, well, Biden is more against God. Uh, what, what did Lionel say about the, the, the knife in the back thing? Yeah. I need to learn <laughs> that, boy, because that's what I was, was going to say right now. <laughs> Go ahead, Delano. Yeah. And, and, and I think, and again, I, I'm not making an endorsement of any particular candidate, but the, the picture that you drew with what you said, Jason, it reminds me of when I was a, a teenager and the church had a building that they owned next door, right? Apartment building. This is in Brooklyn. They needed to do some construction work on the, on the building. They called in me and my friends to do the demo part because they knew you give a bunch of teenagers, teenage boys, sledgehammers, and then you promise them rice and peas and oxtail at the end, and they're going to go to work. But when it came time to rebuild They had to hire professionals because this uh, demolition is one side of the ledger. But then if you want to build something, you need people who can do construction. And those two things are not the same. So we can't eight years later still be talking about, oh, this person exposed the corruption and they tore down this. Yeah, but part of what you want is to is to build something better and to articulate a more positive vision of the society as you see it. And I, I don't I don't necessarily think that that type of construction work is Trump's strong suit. And I will say this, and again, I'm, I'm not super heavy into politics, but I, but I come across things. Um, DeSantis in Florida, while partnering with Chris Rufo, has gotten a lot of the quote unquote woke stuff out of the public universities, the, banning 
um, the types of sort of DEI initiatives and DEI administration that make universities super expensive and make it so that certain types of thoughts can't be expressed on a, on a, on a university campus. I also believe he tried to get Florida's pension funds out of the ESG business, right? Those are two, those are tangible things. Now, if we, what we want are people who, you know, have a good barb and, and they name people and they say, you know, low energy Jeb and tiny Marco and that type of thing. If what we want is the theatrics, then I think that's one thing. But, but governing actually is a profession in the same way, Jason, you as a journalist with 30 plus years of experience are professional. Some dude who writes, you know, can write a pithy line in his basement can't say, oh, well, I do what Jason Whitlock does. We both talk. We both write things. No, journalism is a profession and it has standards and it has ways of operation. And politics is the same thing. So I, I, I think there, there are substantive um, policies, policy prescriptions that some candidates offer. What I'm saying is I also think it's important to pay attention to people's Achilles heels and their weak spots. And, and one candidate in particular, the, the favorite among conservatives, his Achilles heel is twofold. One, anything that is good for the economy, he gives a thumbs up to, which is part of the reason why Pride Month is not just pushed by the government, it's pushed by every single corporation in the country. And two, he's extremely vulnerable to public praise which is why he says, I like Gavin Newsom. He said some nice things about me. And when you combine those things, you know what Disney CEO would do uh, if he wanted to face off against Trump? He, he'd say in the public, man, Trump is the toughest negotiator I've ever had to face down. And, and, and Trump will say, oh, Disney's not that bad. Maybe we should have them build a kingdom in Washington, D.C. And, and the next thing you know, <laughs> when you bring your kids up from Florida to look at the monuments, they they they... Uh, they come up from Florida as as Tammy, who loves to play basketball, and they go back down as Tom, who's who you know has now gotten her, her breast cut off and a fake penis inserted. So th that's the weak spot, and I think we should just be mindful that everybody has an Achilles heel, and we shouldn't look over those those uh, overlook those weaknesses because we like that person's personality. And so I hear what he's saying. Delano, my point would be, and I'm asking Bryson and Shamika this, are we at the build back better stage or are we like, no, we still need some demolition here. We, 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 we're not ready to build back because people, there's too many people that still don't understand how we got in this mess that we're in right now in the first place. Trump doesn't Listen. understand. Go ahead. I was going to say demolition for me. I think we're still in that stage of some things needing to be torn down. Um, yeah. I don't think Trump understands it either. Um, so I'm like complete demolition. I'm not talking about the type of demolition that Trump can do. This country is hellbound. This country is unrepentant. And in Matthew 11, Jesus tells you it's going to be worse for unrepentant cities than it was for Sodom. So uh, I think mm. this country deserves every bad thing it can possibly get. Mm. Mm. That's a pick me up. Uh, I was gonna say, yeah, he's not helping to make you feel better at all. <laughs> uh, I stopped at demolition, but geez. <laughs> I, I just think if I don't think anybody can build anything good right mm. now. The, the, mm. the soil is so damaged and hearts are so polluted and so mm -hmm. demonic and the, the, the people's, they just, they just don't even understand where, where we're at. And like, we're literally, ha people, people like think it's normal to be debating whether a man can get pregnant or, or yeah. it, 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 it's, and so people's minds haven't fully grasped, like we've mm -hmm. gone down such a road of depravity. And look, Trump is not the guy to, to, he's not the ideal person to, to preach a message of repentance and morality. Mm. I totally mm. agree with that. But I haven't seen anybody stand up who, who is the right guy on a national stage. And Carson, you don't think he could do it? 
he's not in the race. I know. I'm just saying, like, if, if somebody could, it would. I think he's probably the most moral person, even though he's pro, pro-vax. He stood, he stood on Bible in his interview. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but who, who what other candidates are out there? DeSantis, it doesn't... He sent uh, Dave Rubin baby onesies, so... <laughs> yeah, I think anybody now would just be coming, sweeping this stuff under the rug. And yes! I still want it to be exposed and, you know, uprooted first. I want people's right. eyes to open first, and yeah. So who's who does that, Delano? I'm, I'm glad Bryson said what he said about DeSantis, right? Because I, I think um, two things. One, I don't think the president of the United States should have the, res- the sole responsibility for sort of get- getting us into a repentant posture, right? God has given us civil government. He's given us the church. He's given us family. He's given us an individual conscience. All of those parts of the ecosystem need to be functioning. But I'll say this, right? Because again, I think every politician is going to be squishy in some in some ways. But there was a period of time in our country's history where where sexual activity, particularly non-normative, so all of the stuff where you put in the pieces that are not supposed to go together, that was all relegated to the private sphere. But what's happened mm-hmm. now is we took private practice and now we promote it publicly. So the question for me is, as for a politician, is not well. Do you still go to Thanksgiving with your gay brother? Do you do you say send a congratulations note to Dave Rubin or, or whoever? The question is, are you going to publicly rebuke Uganda for saying that they are going to execute uh, homosexuals who engage, engage in child rape or rape senior citizens or rape people with disabilities? And, I, and what I know is that the Trump administration, particularly before, said we are on a campaign to uh, uh, legalize basically homosexuality across the globe, right? So, yeah, so for me, it's good. about it's it's about the public promotion and the public proclamations. The I, I wish everyone was a Reformed Baptist or or held to some sort of you know uh, d- uh, Orthodox religious tradition. I understand that's not going to be the case, but I'll take the guy that says, you know what, any of this. You know, two guy, two girl stuff. I know people. I'm not. I don't want to alienate. I don't want to hate people. But I'm. I'm going to send a private message. I'm not going to get on Twitter and say, "Happy Pride Month, y'all." You know what I mean? And and light up mm-hmm. the right the White House in rainbow colors. And and I think, given some of the people that Trump had in his administration, there's a fairly decent chance that that would have been happening even right now in 2023. What, what's the difference though between? publicly congratulating Dave Rubin on buying a baby like cattle mm-hmm. and saying happy Pride Month. Matter of fact, I would say congratulating mm-hmm. Dave Rubin is worse than saying happy Pride Month. I, I, I'll tell you the difference. It's, it's the, well, I'll, I'll give you a different example to show the difference between private and public. We acknowledge <clears throat> that people in this country consume pornography, right? It's out there. It's out there. And it's a problem for many reasons. There's a difference between a guy going home in his room and he's looking at porn on his smartphone i'm saying difference culturally there's a difference between that right a sin with which for which he will have to repent and if let's say he's he's, he says he's a believer that he gonna come up on the church discipline for that there's a difference between that and you taking your fiance or your kids or your girlfriend or your wife to the mall and as soon as you park the car there's a 60 in, there's a 60 foot billboard that's showing pornography right before you even get to the front door. So what I'm saying is what you do publicly is a reflection of your cultural norms because there's always been sin in the world, but in wide societies um, that sin is not celebrated publicly because it, it allows the disorder to spread. Certain things you should be in the closet doing. If you're going to do them, you're, you're certainly not look, there's, there's homosexuals in Saudi Arabia. There's homosexuals in, in Uganda. They just know that if you're doing certain types of behavior, all of that stops when you leave your, your front door. So what I'm saying is, yes, would I prefer everyone to believe as I did? Yes, I would. But ultimately, the president and our elected officials, through law and policy, are partially responsible for shaping our public culture. And our public culture, to your point, Bryson, 
is completely corrupted and, and it worships a new God and it has a new orthodoxy. It has new blasphemy laws. And, and you see the first day in June gives you a front, a, a, a front page look at what the next four to eight years would look like under another Democratic president. I don't think I'm asking, like a lot of people think I'm asking for the perfect candidate. I'm not, because 15 years ago, you wouldn't be, even if it was private, you would, you would not see a Republican running for office seeing any of these people or call Blair White a she. It wouldn't exist. Nobody, mm -hmm. even, even if they did it behind the scenes, you wouldn't see it publicly on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So um, now that we see these people doing these things, I don't care if it's uh, Blair White, I think his real name is Rob. I don't care if it's Bruce <laughs> Jenner. I don't care if they Ruben, I don't mm -hmm. care who it is. The fact that people that are claiming to be Republicans are running for office are publicly congratulating these people on things that is like pff, worse than saying. And they're getting congratulated and propped up publicly. That shows me they're that person's character. So when they get in office, Everything else is nonsense. Cause I, I I watch people character. I pay attention to to what they do. I pay attention to it. So when they do stuff like that, man, we already know what they're gonna do when they get in office. Hmm. I, I mean, this was a very I, I, good I, I, conversation. I, I got, I got, I got. We gotta. Okay. We don't went much longer. We gotta stop, Delano. I'm I'm sorry. Steve Kim's gonna be mad at me, and we didn't even get to. Bryson and Shamika are working on a, a retake uh, the Rainbow song for me. And we'll, we'll get that out next week, hopefully. Uh, we wanted to talk about that, but we, we've run out of time because uh, I got to get to Steve Kim and talk a little bit of sports. But man, this was a good conversation. I'm glad you guys uh, participated and didn't bite your tongues. That was awesome. Uh, let me, before we go to Steve Kim, I want to tell you guys about uh, our friends at Cozy Earth. Hotter weather used to mean goodbye to a good night's sleep until I discovered Cozy Earth. Cozy Earth bedding is so soft, luxurious, and temperature regulating, I'm sleeping better than I have in years. Listen, there's a good reason why Cozy Earth has thousands of five-star reviews at CozyEarth.com. It's truly awesome bedding. Here's one from Holly. Honestly, the best sheets we've ever had. Absolutely a dream to sleep, to slip into each night. Everyone deserves to splurge on these sheets. You'll have no regrets. I can back her up on that because I've got cozy earth bedding at home. I have two different bedrooms that I sleep in. One has cozy earth, one doesn't. I sleep on the cozy earth bed far more often than the other because it keeps me cool at night. Cozy earth sheets made from 100% viscous from bamboo are now available in seven colors. For a limited time, save up to 35% on Cozy Earth. Be sure to check out their ultra soft loungewear and plush bath towel collection too. Go to CozyEarth.com slash fearless and be sure to enter fearless at checkout to save up to 35%. All backed by a 100 night sleep trial and a 10 year warranty. That's CozyEarth.com slash fearless for up to 35% off. Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell. Go to heaven with freedom. It's my obligation, no hate, discrimination, raising up your hands for freedom. All right, welcome back. Uh, time for some Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell. Steve, big news out of Los Angeles and Fox Sports headquarters. Uh, Shannon Sharp is leaving undisputed mm -hmm. at the conclusion of the NBA Finals, breaking up uh, with Skip Bayless. I don't know if it's all that surprising given all the tension they had uh, in the previous year, you know, going all the way back to DeMar Hamlin and all the other disputes that they, they've had. But Shannon is going his own way. Part of me thinks... Is this the end of the embrace debate era? Ha has has the milk gone bad on fake contrived debate shows? Well, Jason, here, here's the thing. Uh, I'd say for the past five, six months, they were very disputed. I mean, let's go all the way back, <laughs> going to the DeMar Hamlin thing and other things in terms of respecting Shannon Sharp's Hall of Fame ability compared to Tom Brady. Uh, I, I've said this before. They were like that couple at the dinner party that started arguing 
right in the middle of dinner. Uh, and then when they got home, they started sleeping in separate beds. And it's obvious Shannon had moved out to the Holiday Inn for the past couple of months. And now he's filed the divorce papers and he's just swiping left, right, up, down on Tinder because he's got a lot of options. So I don't know. This format has been successful. The question that I have, Jason, to add to your query is, is this the end of Skip Bayless? Because I don't think this format's going to go anywhere. I mean, there's 24 hours in a day. You have to fill it with talking heads. The debate structure works when it's actually entertaining and it's authentic and there's people that you like. The question that I have, if they're going to keep Skip Bayless in that role and this franchise moves forward, who do you get opposite Skip Bayless? Now, I have a name that I know you're not going to agree with, and I don't know if it's realistic, but no, I, I don't think it's the end of this format. I hope not, because that's what part of me and you do. Of course, we do it at a much higher cerebral level. But I'm just saying it's not the end of it. The question is, is this the end of a career that for so long, I don't know if dominated the genre, but was certainly an important part of it in Skip Bayless? I, I think I'm going to distinguish between what you and I do and what they do. <laughs> We, we don't, I'm serious, we, I, we don't even have discussions about, hey, what side of the, this argument is Steve on? What side is Whitlock on? Okay, let's discuss that. The, we have discussions, not debates. Sometimes we disagree. But to me, I just we're just two guys talking sports, and sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't. Th th that, that show has contrived debates. Shannon Sharp's a Hall of Fame football player that took on the role and then it, it actually, it was a role at first. Now he actually is LeBron James' stepdaddy. No. And, and, you know, he plays the opposite side of I love LeBron and Skip, you hate LeBron. It, it, it's, it's all contrived. And so I, I'm just wondering if that aspect, do I think sports discussions and all that are going to continue on television and every place else? Absolutely. But this whole little contrived thing, I, look, look at what Stephen A. Smith is doing. He, does it, he, he brings in a rotating cast of people to talk sports with, and, and sometimes they agree, sometimes they disagree. They, they mostly just have fun. And first takes, ratings are actually growing where, you know, undisputed have been stale or decreasing over the last year or two. Jason, I, I completely agree with you there that if it's contrived where you are forced to take the black or white side, and there's never any gray area, there's an issue. Because it, it, it's just forced, it's contrived, it's fake, it's phony, it's not fraudulent. You know, me and you, most of the times we agree, and when we disagree, it's obviously when you're wrong. But putting that aside, we're always good-natured about it, right? You're right. I mean, could you imagine if me and you yeah. did a show, daily show like that, a Korean and a black house, thinking about it, we could call it the riot. I mean, it would, it would be boffa. It would play in Peoria. I don't know about Koreatown. <laughs> All the rooftop Koreans, they may feel a certain way, but it'd be great. But honestly, I would never want to do a show where you're telling me you have to take this position because your co-host is taking that position. I think people see through that. It's not authentic, and it does not work. Now, this is interesting about Shannon Sharp. I actually congratulate him for this move because if he's going to go fully independent, and again, I have no clue what he's going to move do here, and he's just going to say, you know what? I'm going to do the Shannon Sharp Network. I'm going to go full renegade and do what Pat McAfee was and use the platform that I've already built to be who I am and say whatever the hell I want. Anyone else, be damned. You're not going to censor me. I want to applaud him. And I just happened to look at the numbers on YouTube for his podcast network or channel. has over a million views. That is very substantial. He's got something there that he can ride. But again, now it's more work now. Now because becoming an owner has responsibility. Okay, you're not just an employee, and you know this, Jason, you made a similar type of transition. Now you gotta be on top of everything. I don't know if he really wants to do that. On the flip side, Skip Bayless, who certainly Hold is Hold for one brand. second, hold for one yeah. second, hold for one second before we get, to, I wanna respond to your take on Shannon Sharp, and then we'll get to Skip Bayless. I agree with you, and I've actually watched some of Club Shay Shay, and and I hope you're. I know you're seated. Brace yourself. Club Shay Shay ain't bad. That is the best of Shannon Sharp. 
I, he, it's, it's a totally different persona. He actually comes across like a decent talk show host. The guests enjoy him. He enjoys the guest. They have good conversation. He's not a horrible interviewer. The guy can actually host the show. And I, I, I think you're a thousand percent right that he could end up being the black Pat McAfee. A fan duel or one of these gambling companies may come in and drop a bag on him to be associated with his show. Uh, and, and the other thing, I just keeping it all the way for, and everybody that's watched this show knows I, I have problems with Shannon Sharp and his race baiting and all that. But Shannon has a work ethic. He, he, he's not afraid to go it alone and put the work in. Uh, so I do think Shannon going solo actually has a lot of upside, and I, I do think he's going to be fine. Pat Blackafee. It's catchy. <laughs> kind of like that. You know, but, but the overall point is, and I've been, I was a huge Shannon Sharp fan when he was a player. He's in my Mount Rushmore of tight ends. He's actually underrated as a player, to be, believe it or not. And I know people say he can't block. Look, he had a running back rush for 2,000 yards behind him in that offensive line. He had to be getting in the way of somebody. But the problem became in the last year or so, especially with that unfettered defense of LeBron James, he went from being a really funny character to an uncomfortable caricature. And it's that fine line that I think you have to be able to kind of toe. And you're right about Shannon as an interview. I saw most of the stuff that he did with Deion Sanders. Because of his stature, and maybe because he's also black, let's be honest, he has a way of engaging some of these subjects and bringing out certain answers and discussions that maybe other people can't, and it works. But now, again, can you be the captain of the ship instead of a very high-paid employee? That's one of the tougher adjustments you have to make. So this is going to be interesting, but again, I salute Shannon Sharp for this because I went through this a couple years ago. If you have to go into a workplace every day or do a job that you don't like and you're unhappy, that in itself is like a prison sentence. It is. And so it, it, I'm telling you, people that have listened to me criticize Shannon Sharp, like, how come he's never said these things before? Well, because, you know, mostly I was never in position or the topic didn't come up. But right. I get why Shannon thinks he was a bigger deal on Undisputed than Skip, and Skip had control of the show, and that's why Shannon was frustrated. But that's what Shannon signed, signed up for. Yes. And so I don't think it was fair to complain, well, it's Skip's show, and Skip controls it, and blah, blah, blah. That's what you signed up for, bro. Uh, and I thought Shannon's attacks on Skip Bayless were unfair. I thought some of the stuff at the end is related to DeMar Hamlin, skipping work and all that, very unprofessional, getting offended because Skip says something about Tom Brady and being a better player. All that stuff you're supposed to laugh off. You're a Hall of Fame football player. Skip couldn't even make his varsity high school basketball team. Just laugh that stuff off and keep it moving. But he has to understand that Fox Sports made an investment in Skip Bayless he was their guy. You signed up to be the number two quarterback, be the number two quarterback, or do what you're doing now, exit and leave. And, and I, again, I'll say it again. I think whatever he comes up with on his own on YouTube, or if he goes to another network, I, I don't know if ESPN would be have an interest or whatever. I do think he'll be fine. I hope he does less race baiting. I hope he's more like the guy that I see on his club, Shay Shay. That guy is fun, likable, entertaining, and gets good stuff out of guests. No problem with Shannon Sharp in that regard. Now pivot to your take on why you think this could be the end of Skip Bayless. Well, he's running out of partners, and you got to have a contrast, and you got to have someone that's going to have fun. I saw some of the suggestions that you made on Twitter about who do you pair with Skip Bayless. I don't like any of them, Jay. I'll be, they, they, they're, they're all malcontents, and they're going to whine, and they're, they don't know how to take the ribbing, and it's going to get very tense and tight and uncomfortable to watch. So we need Jay guys. Williams? Oh, Jay yeah. Williams? You just think? Yeah, that's, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. No. No. Why not? No. 
Uh, he gets too emotional. I've seen some of. Look, I don't mind Jay, but he gets into it where he gets a little whiny. I I, I got a name that's fun. That's Keyshawn Johnson. Keyshawn Keyshawn, Johnson. Keyshawn, as the kids say, will get in his feelings. We need a guy that can laugh at and with Skip Bayless. This guy's a Hall of Famer. Come on, you know who I'm thinking of. And this guy fits Skip. Skip covered him, and Skip actually respected him. Oh, Michael Irvin? Yes, the showmaker. The showmaker. Bring him out of exile. Free Michael Irvin. Please. I don't know what's going on. Free Michael Irvin, but... The problem is, if Michael Irvin, uh, Troy Aikman may never talk to him again if this happens. The, the, if you know that history between Troy and Skip. But let's go back to Skip Bayless. I read all his Dallas Cowboy books, God's Coach, all that stuff. And I don't know if it was fiction, because you know how these things go. But he has a deep respect for the playmaker. He's actually said that guy was the most important guy on the Cowboys 90s team. He actually thought emotionally what he brought was an X factor that not a lot of teams had, okay? So Michael knows how to take a joke. He's incredibly self-deprecating because of his past. I mean, he's made jokes about the White House. Uh, I remember one time he was on a Dan Patrick studio uh, a remote from the Super Bowl, and something was coming down from the roof, and it was white powder, and it was on his jacket. And he said, hold on, fellas, this white powder? I didn't bring this, guys. And it was the most hilarious thing because, yeah, he actually did that. And the whole audience just broke up like, I just want to know, this is not my powder. I mean, he does that all the time. Michael may not have a lot of options right now, unfortunately, because I think he's been me too and railroaded. But those two guys can have fun. This, I, I thought the problem with Undisputed when we would talk about it, and again, I'm not an everyday viewer, it got too tense. It got too serious, and it got a little personal. Michael will poke fun at himself more than Skip Bayless ever could, and I I actually think it would work. Love the suggestion, particularly during football season. Yes. What, what happens during basketball season? You don't think Michael watches basketball? He watches yeah, he basketball. Does. He does, and by the way, I remember in the – Early 90s, they used to have the Foot Locker Slam Dunk Challenge. Michael was in it. Never won it. He did the same dunk over and over again. He played some basketball. You remember that with Chris Carter, Mike Conley, Kenny Lofton? Yeah, I, look, look, I love the Michael Irvin suggestion. It, it is. I, I just I don't understand why the NFL Network and, and ESPN walked away from him. It seemed like that hotel thing was kind of shady and, and whatever. But, and so there may be some risk to yes. uh, picking up Michael for Fox Sports because, you know, if he has one more allegation and why'd you have, but I do, look, I love Michael Irvin. I think he's great. I do think he, you're talking, that could potentially, and that this is no shot at Shannon Sharp. It's a shot, it's a statement about the relationship between Sharp and, and, and Skip Bayless. I've already told you, right. Shannon will be fine doing his own show. It's actually halfway decent. I can recommend it. But Michael Irvin would actually be an upgrade for that show. He might be. And look, if I'm FS1, I tell Michael, Michael, look, we're taking a risk here. We're going to make it very clear. When you're traveling to any event, you're going to have the Secret Service and the S1Ws surrounding you. In fact, we're going to have a Pope mobile. <laughs> we're going to make sure you say hi to no females. Okay? You might be able to dap up a guy, but if there's any female, we are clearing them out like the Red Sea. We value your employment here. We want you to get paid. Now, the only downside, Jason, about this combination, one of them's going to only have to be able to talk about the Cowboys a week. I, 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 we can't have this become cowboy talk. Five days a week. That'd be too much, but 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 it's a nothing is perfect. But I think that combination could work because Michael would know how to roll with the punches and have some fun with this. Steve, this is some of your best work. It's a good suggestion. Yeah. I can't believe I didn't I think of it. What I do. Uh, I, I, I I still think Jay Williams wouldn't be bad. I think somebody suggested Ryan Clark. More I think about it, no, I think that would be no. terrible. 
Uh, we, you get more of uh, Skip pandering as Ryan Clark played the race card every other day. That wouldn't be good. And, and, and the other thing about Michael is Michael's not one of these race card playing guys. No, he's Michael not. loves I mean, everybody, man. Look, I've studied Michael Irvin for a very long time, going back to the best damn sports show. That show was very important in his career because it kind of rehabilitated his public image and also sharpened his ability to communicate. Look, in, in my view, Michael Irvin's one of those few guys that will say things other people won't. In certain ways, he is like the Charles Barkley version of football. I mean, we played that clip last year, Jason, and where he basically said on air, look, let's not kid ourselves. I'm from that era. We all took smelling salts while we were concussed. We got out there because we wanted to. Other guys would be deathly afraid of losing their jobs. Michael's like, no, 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 we did that. We, and I'm like, we need honesty like that. The other thing is, and, and, and you've done various shows. I've done various shows. I can honestly tell you, for the most part, I, I have learned this. Chemistry cannot be created artificially. And generally, when I've had the shows that I really like to do, and you've had partners and I've had partners, if I don't actually like that person off the air, it's not going to work. I can honestly tell you, every job that I have, I actually really enjoy being around the people that I work with. Even you, Jason, believe it or not, all the badgering you give me. But if you don't actually <laughs> like the people and there's this underlying, I don't want to say hatred, but animosity, it, it'll show up on air. And that's what I noticed with Shannon and Skip the last six, seven, eight months. Steve, good work. Great hey, work. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we'll see you next week. Thank you, Steve. All right, get your Fearless Army swag at shopblazemedia.com slash fearless. Hit those likes. Give me the five-star review over at Apple. Uh, Jordan Bowles, our NBA enthusiast, next. All right, welcome back. Uh, game one of the NBA Finals is tipping off tonight. Wanted to talk a little NBA, so we wanted to circle back to our main man, Jordan Bowles, our NBA enthusiast. Jordan, welcome back to the program. We're actually not going to talk about the NBA Finals. We're actually going to talk about Monty Williams getting the Detroit Pistons job and becoming the highest paid coach in the history of the NBA. This seems crazy to me. The guy got fired, and, and keep in mind, I love Monty Williams. Probably my favorite NBA coach. I think he's great. I love his values. But you don't get fired, have no championships, and then get the highest paid coaching job in NBA history this makes no sense to me. Does it make sense to you? No, it does not. Uh, it has nothing to go back himself on. I mean, other than he say, she say, I guess. He, Monty's a great guy. He's great in the locker room. He's a leader of men, as they say. You know, I don't know if it's necessarily true, given his track record. But, uh I don't see how you get fired and then circle back and become the highest paid guy. I, I don't see it. I would have paid Doc Rivers before I paid Monty Williams. And Doc. Oh, Andrews. stop. No, Weird. no, 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 <laughs> yes. no, yes. no, yes. no, no, Jordan. Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> no. I would have paid Doc Rivers before I paid Monty Williams, Jason. I would have paid Doc Rivers before I paid Monty Williams. 100%. He's got something. Why? Why? Something. Back that, back that something. statement up. Back, okay. Okay. What? You give Doc the talent that's going to play like he's had before back in Boston. Okay, those guys played and played hard. They got something done. Okay, Monty had Kevin Durant, D. Book, and then poor Chris Paul. He's 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 like an old BMW doesn't run anymore. So I can't really, you know, put too much on his back. You know, I wouldn't pay Chris Paul Jack, but that's just me. Uh, you give Doc those guys that's going to play and play hard. I like that team's chances, to be honest, more than I like Monty Williams, guys. Didn't he have Kawhi Leonard and Paul George they didn't in L.A.? Play. They didn't play. They don't like to play. 
Kawhi Leonard and Paul George wake up each morning and like, eh, I might play today. And then, oh, I don't feel like playing when it's time to play. I, those guys, they don't play and play hard. You know, KD, when it came down to it in the playoffs, he was there. D-Book was there. And both of them played hard and played as hard as they could. DeAndre Aiden was a variable every other night. Uh, but I don't see where Monty earns his money. You know, it's not like he came in and he took the Suns from – dirt bottom to you know gold top you know is, is this i don't see where you earn where he earns his money i didn't see it i didn't see it it's yeah, not like you I, I don't get it detroit and, and fix the whole mess they have over there even though i do like some of their young talent uh i just don't know where those guys heads are at as far as you know coming in to compete which i think monty will in instill in those guys you know you're gonna come in and compete you're going to be on time to things. You're not going to lose focus on the main, you know, the task at hand, which is basketball, which I think a lot, a lot of young guys have a problem with nowadays in the league. So I think Monty will be, could be good for the young guys. Let's just say that. Eleven, twelve million million, $12 million a year makes no sense. Uh, I want to move on to one other it. topic that does relate to the NBA Finals. Most people believe Nikola Jokic and the Denver Nuggets are going to win this championship. And if they do, it's going to establish Nikola as the player right now, taking the torch from LeBron James. He's got two MVPs, should have probably had a third this year. Now he'll have that championship. But beyond Nikola Jokic, one of the things that's interesting is when you look at Luka Doncic, when you look at uh, Joel Embiid, What's what's the guy Shea, uh, yeah, Gil, Shea, whatever the shade, yeah, over in uh, yeah. Oklahoma City. Th- there's a few up Sabonis in Sacramento. It's like there's if you so look many. at the top ten, top ten guys in the NBA, like seven, eight of them are foreign-born players. I-, I I think there was only one American-born player on the All NBA team this year, and that was Jason Tatum. And so when, when you look at that, it, it, and you throw Giannis in there and Luka Doncic, and again, Nikola Jokic ain't even on there and should be on that, on that team. That's what happened to the American-born basketball player? Is it over for them? I don't think it's over, but I, I will suggest maybe uh, a situation that's going on with American-born players. Let's look at John ja Morant, uh, a very distracted young man. We can say that. I think the distractions that are present here in the States to these players take away from the focus of basketball. These foreign guys, okay, they're playing in pro ball at 15, 16 years old. I remember back in uh, Westbrook's MVP season, preseason game, they play against uh, Luka Doncic. 17-year-old Luca. Nobody even knows who Luca is back then uh, in 2016. Those guys are playing pro early. And here we have like an OTE league now uh, put on by overtime, which is like, you know, it's, it's kind of getting there. They've enabled the little G League Ignite thing. But I just think the player development that goes on overseas and where all they have to do is play basketball. They're not going to eight hours of school every day to do, you know, maybe an hour worth of things that are actually worth something to learn. Those dudes are playing ball eight to 10 hours a day. They're playing, practicing and, and doing all these other things while over here, you know, these dudes are going partying and waving guns on Instagram and uh, a whole bunch of, Whole bunch of nonsense. Zion Williams is in them fast food drive through lanes. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's I mean, at the Zion, tattoo you know, parlor. You know, he's in Louisiana. So, he, I mean, in, in, yeah, New Orleans. So it's like he's just surrounded by food all the time. So that that's another, that's a great point. You know, here in the States, I mean, you turn a corner, you're going to see a McDonald's, you're going to see an Arby's. It's, <laughs> I mean, over there, they're probably just eating good, probably better food anyway. That's a great point. I, I just think... I, I like your point about distractions, that the right. foreign-born players come over here 
and they're focused on, hey, this ain't my culture. I'm here to play basketball. I enjoy America. But these American-born players spend all their whole formative years, oh, when I get to the NBA, we're going to hit the strip clubs. Right. I'm, you I'm made a great point have all this- uh, a week ago with, like, Cam Newton, you know, how these guys are – so focused in on like the the fashion and I'm I love Cam Newton. I'm one of his biggest fans and I support Cam, but you were right when it comes down to the the distraction of the hair and worrying about, you know, what am I gonna wear to the game and thing like that. Now these foreign guys, you know, sometimes they can put on some style, but I think they come to play, you know, every night. It's not like back in the day, these American born guys, let's look at Deion Sanders. I mean you look good, you play good, you play good, they pay good. And Nowadays, I don't think they worry about that. How many followers do I have on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok? You know, I think that's what they worry about nowadays. It's a very good point. Jordan, who you like in the series? How many games? I'm sorry, I got a dog in here. <laughs> who you I like in the series? Uh, How many games? I like the Nuggets in five. Mm, all right. We'll hold you to it. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Uh, that's Jordan Bowles. You should be hearing tomorrow. That means we'll see you tomorrow. Riley Gaines on the show tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all deceiving We all wanna be free We want freedom I just want, I wanna be I just want